a section of the video supported by TIN. To build any flight ready rockets, it must consist of the following components propulsion, structure, guidance navigation control, landing systems, among many more. And all of them must be of the highest engineering precision and reliability. Starship is no different. Although some of those systems could be duplicated from existing technologies on Falcon Eye, such as the guidance navigation control system and the communication system, the biggest challenge a Starship faces is with its structures, landing and re-entry systems. This is the reason why SpaceX is iterating fast with SN1 and more to come in the future. Structure and landing in particular is a big question mark for SpaceX, with Falcon 9 demonstrating a good track record with the highest MECO velocity of 11,083 km per hour, but not nearly good enough for Starship to travel to the moon. This is why SpaceX has adopted a new and radical design for Starship. Though Falcon 9 is relatively large among rockets at 70 meters tall and 3.7 meters in diameter, it is dwarfed by Starship and Super Heavy. Not only that, if Starship were to do cis-lunar and Mars trips regularly, it will need to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at a higher velocity and frequency than Falcon 9. The damage done to Booster 1057 during the fastest re-entry of SpaceX history has cost SpaceX the booster, but the more important lesson is for Starship and whether Starship could demonstrate better capability with its current design. SpaceX's goal of one-day turnaround with no refurbishment also requires radical changes. Both designs and rapid iterations have become a well-known secret for SpaceX success. The most courageous design change has been to adopt stainless steel as Starship's structural material. Many of us are interested in knowing how much progress has SpaceX made so far, so here is how NASA sees it. This is a design lifecycle for NASA programs. It shows clearly how NASA's space program go from a concept to reality from a macro level. But going deeper into the details, I want to show you this chart, also courtesy of NASA, which shows technology readiness levels, TRL. From TRL-1 to TRL-9, space technology goes from a mere concept to flight-proven realities. Falcon Eye's landing technology, for example, is a TRL-9 technology, and Crew Dragon is at level 8 because it is flight qualified through tests and demonstrations, but has not yet carried out its maiden flight. However, TRL alone does not give us the full picture. It is only for individual components. An additional metric is used called Integrated Readiness Level, IRL. This represents the vehicle's readiness when different components work together. The overall readiness is then calculated with a formula putting both TRL and IRL together. You want both of them to have a high score to have a high overall readiness level. Well, now let's shift back to Starship. It gets more complex when we try to fit Starship into this formula, because before SpaceX, no one in the space industry was making such bold plans, and more importantly, no one has a, a greater track record of success. On the surface, Starship does a great job when it comes to its readiness, and SpaceX is easily the most exciting space companies pushing its readiness scores by rapidly testing and rebuilding and testing again. But on the technology level, we all know that there are technologies that SpaceX is trying very hard to invent. Reusability and landing of Falcon 9 boosters is a proven technology, but that's not equivalent to landing from a much faster velocity. Falcon 9's record right now is 11,083 km per hour before re-entry, which is not enough if Starship were to come back frequently from the moon. What about the heat shield? Is Starship ready in that regard? When it comes to the heat shield, SpaceX has an ultra-high standard. On top of being able to withstand high temperature, it must also be able to fly again the next day with zero refurbishment. March last year, SpaceX tested Starship's heat shield hex tile. The hottest part of the tile withstood temperature of 1,650 Kelvin, that's a whopping 1,377 degrees Celsius. Even at this incredible temperature, it is not good enough for Starship during ultra-high-speed re-entry. Musk suggested at the time that SpaceX might need to add transpirational cooling where the heat shield fails. In September, seven hex tiles were spotted on Starhopper and one more near the engine. This shows that SpaceX has anticipated the high-speed re-entry scenario for Starship. As a result, the same tiles were tested on Dragon capsule during orbital re-entry from a very high velocity. The results were successful. 
The fact that Cargill Dragon's ceramics Starship Hextile appear to be almost completely unscathed after their first orbital re-entry is an excellent sign that SpaceX is making progress in the materials design department, or is at least taking flight testing extremely seriously. This brings us to where we are today. We see the effort SpaceX put into Starship. Since the transition into stainless steel, Starship has gone through multiple hop tests, hover tests, testing of the heat shield materials, and now it aims to do orbital flights, with SN1 in the progress and many more to come. Elon stated himself that the first orbital flight will probably be the fourth or fifth prototype in 2020, which is not too far from now. But if I were to take a guess, is Starship ready for orbital flight in 2020? At the pace SpaceX is building and testing Starship right now, I think we have a slim chance of having orbital flight this year. But here's why. It is not of technical capability, but that building Starship is a complex supply chain problem, not a technical problem. How would you build huge toolings needed for the actual Starship? Is Raptor engine's production line ready for large quantity manufacturing? When you compound all those supply chain problems together, it becomes a time consuming process. We'll be able to do Blue Origin style suborbital tests in 2020, but probably not the orbital ones. In the social media age we are in right now, people want things to happen fast. And I totally understand that. SpaceX is such an exciting company, but there are rules and timeframes to testing rockets and they exist for a reason. Based on many years of experiences and often lessons learned from accidents, maybe I'm old school, but I think we've got to be patient about this. This section of the video is supported by TIN. TIN is a mobile carrier that does things differently. TIN has no contract and you pay for what you use as opposed to be forced to select a plan. Whether it's a few messages, a couple minutes here and there, or two or three gigs of data, you can customize what you use every month. The average TIN bill is just $23 per month per phone. So the more phones on one TIN account, the less you pay per phone because usage is shared across all your devices. There's no contracts and it's hustle free. TIN offers nationwide LTE coverage on T-Mobile, Sprint, and Verizon, so the phone you already own will likely to work with TIN. Just grab a SIM card from the TIN shop and you're good to go. Finally, for our audiences here, see how much you could save at elephant.tin.com and get a $25 credit to try TIN Mobile with no strings attached. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.